Guys, welcome to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Matthias Turner, and today I'm super pumped. I've got Dr. Jay Davidson with us. Dr. Jay, welcome. It is great to be here. Excited to uh, yeah talk to your audience. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, to give you a bit more of uh, of an introduction, I probably I probably won't do the best job. So, I'd love for you to chime in on this as well. But um, you're the author of multiple books, so you've got the Five Steps to Restoring Health Protocol, as well as Davidson's Principles and Practice of Medicine, as well as you're the host of Chronic Lyme Disease Summit. There's been one, two, and three now, um, as well as co-host of the Detox Project. What else have I missed out? Uh, yeah, wrote a couple books. The second book is called How to Fix Lyme Disease. Um, ah, cool. The other, the other one you said was pretty good though too. Whatever that is. So but that's not yours. <laughs> but. Uh, no, no. Ah, there's another no. Dr. J. Davidson then. Well, there you go. We, yeah. we're, uh, I'm getting cloned here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, a little quick background, trained chiropractor, ran a very successful clinic, uh, wife had my daughter, and that's when the bottom fell out and she nearly died and everything shifted to heal her. And what we realized was it was chronic toxicity and chronic infection, including Lyme disease, that pretty much reared its head and that's what took her down and almost took her life. And uh, luckily enough, she was able to make it through it. And um, you know, my daughter is now six and a half years old right now, so uh, this has been quite a journey, but she's the healthiest she's ever been today. And what I looked at, at that moment of wow, why like, why are we going through this? Why is she almost dying? To now saying thank you, thank you because this has shaped our path. This has shaped our journey, and I realize now looking back, like if this hadn't happened, uh, we'd be in a completely different place. And uh, where we're at now is just really where we have been called and really meant to be. And and there's been a lot of learning, right? So I'd like to say from mess to message from pain to purpose, mm. from test to testimony. So for somebody that's maybe struggling, that's listening, like, you know, keep going, stay strong. And uh, you might not understand right now, like what this means in your life. But as you look back and reflect and keep moving forward, it might get clearer. Yeah. And I mean, to put a bit more light around the situation of what you and your wife went through, um, after reading your book, The Five Steps to Restoring Health Protocol, it talks deep about like, you guys spent pretty much over a hundred grand just on seeing different physicians to try and figure out what was going on. Um, you spent like 400 grand on different protocols just trying to get things underway. So like you spent a lot of money really testing out every single thing that you could um, and it went for multiple years. And like she she had was diagnosed with Lyme's disease when she was seven, I believe. Yeah, yep, yep. So she, um, you know, got sick. She was apparently a healthy kid until seven and all of a sudden, uh, got sick and they didn't understand what was going on. They gave her some medication that uh, that triggered brain encephalitis, mm. uh, and then she went comatose. And, and that kind of is where everything spiraled down. They realized when she was seven years old, she's thirty uh, six now. I don't know if she wants me to tell you, but she's thirty six now. And um, you know, she so she you know had chronic Lyme disease years ago, and with not really getting to the source. She always just, you know, did things to get by, but that's kind of what triggered all these different health issues from sinus surgery to heart surgery to, you know, you name it, she just kind of just went through it. So she was sick of being the guinea pig. So it was like, you know, don't practice, don't try anything like we're just going to get by. And then when my daughter came, it was like, I looked at it like, oh my gosh, you know, like, is my daughter a curse? And, and, and now I look at it like, no, she was the blessing. The blessing. She was what actually forced us to dig deep and figure out what are these underlying sources because honestly when you're getting by like why would you want to dig deep why why mm. would you want to stir the pot it's almost like you need some type of crisis or life altering moment whether it's <clears throat> you know some physical trauma emotional trauma or chemical trauma that triggers something that puts you over that then makes you reevaluate you know and so um inevitably i think it really comes down to this that either we view life or things that are happening that they're either happening to us, which is not a good place to be, mm. or they're happening for us, which is a great place to be. It's a very simple concept, but the moment that we shift and realize that everything is happening for us, life is completely different. So there's a lot of emotions that get tied in with illness, that get tied in with life in general, but I think that's probably one of the most profound things that I've really picked up on our journey. Yeah, definitely. I think that's so powerful. And we, we find that often when we're talking to people about nutrition, um, and it's usually like people come to us and say, Hey, I've been diagnosed with celiac disease or I can't, I can't have gluten, like, uh, sorry, uh, lactose anymore. 
and they they in that mindset of the victim of like, well, why me? Why why can't I have these delicious foods? And it's like, well, no, it's probably the best thing that could have happened to you because these foods are foods that are causing issues for a lot of people anyway. So if if you're really going to get some good results and you actually want to be healthy, then it's probably the best thing that has happened to you. Getting the diagnosis that says, hey, you can't have that. So now you've got a reason to stop rather than rather than just trying to work against your willpower. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and when you look at food sensitivities, food allergies, parasite infection is one of the number one things I've seen, especially in the dairy allergy. I, I was dairy, I was allergic to dairy uh, growing up, but I'd have on and off periods where I was really, I was really sensitive, mm. and I'd be putting apple juice on my cereal, and then other moments where it was like not as intense, so waxed and waned. And uh, looking back now, I realized I had chronic parasitic infection or parasite infection yeah, wow. uh, since I was a little kid, never dealt with it. And as soon as I cleared that out, then all of a sudden my sensitivities and allergies went away. And even my good friend, Dr. Todd Watts, he had a severe dairy allergy, went five years, no dairy because anything he would touch would just like, you know, cause a massive reaction. And then as he cleared parasites out himself, uh, he's like, I'm going to try this out. So I think he was at like at five guys in a burger, you know, some place that's not great and had a milkshake and did absolutely fine. And he's like, wow, this is it. Like hmm. this is, this is one of those things that was actually triggering it. So, um, it, it, it is, we really want to ask questions. Hmm. We want to ask, okay, rather than not the why me question, like why am I allergic or why am I struggling with this? Why, why can't I recover after a workout? But somebody else does, right? Why, why, why does my food have to be so restrictive and I don't get any I don't get any leeway on it. As you ask questions more about that versus why me, then it's more empowering. Yeah. So going back to the parasites really quick, what what um, did you guys do or what did you do in particular to get rid of your parasites and what was the parasite in particular that was causing the, the dairy issue? Um, I don't know the specific parasite that was causing the dairy issue. I've had mm. a ton of different ones come out of me. I mean, it's kind of gross to talk about, but at yeah. the same time, it's, it's just being real. Mm. Um, I, was, I was speaking on stage uh, at a seminar, um, gosh, it's probably been almost four years ago now. And, uh, one guy, I didn't get some, and I'm like, wow, this guy's either a jerk or he's just really smart and wants to know like, you know, some answers. I think I was talking about hormones and Lyme disease. And then, uh, after, after I got off stage, you know, we went up to each other and we're just chatting. I'm like, oh, this guy's actually really nice. He's just a really smart guy and just wants to know like the pathways and how everything connects. And, and so we went out to dinner uh, with some other with some other people that we knew, and he's showing me pictures on his phone, and I'm like, "What is that? It's like these long things that come out of people, little strips, these big chunks of stuff." There's this guy holding up a six foot tapeworm. I'm like, Far "What around. is going on? You know, like, what are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh, it's this thing called mimosa pudica seed," and I'm like, "Say that again." He had to say it like three <laughs> times, mimosa pudica seed. Um, and so I know like there's an alcoholic drink called mimosas, like champagne and orange juice, Yeah. but this is, uh, put a pudica at the end and then it's the seed form. And, and so he's like, Oh, immediately my curiosity, you know, sparked. Spot, I'm like, yeah. well, I want to try that, you know, like it just, that's just who I am. And so he sent me a bottle and I started taking it and about, uh, six days in, um, like had this little thing kind of poking off of my stool. I'm like, oh, that doesn't look normal. So I poked it. It's like a six inch worm. So I text, I text uh, Dr. Todd Watts. I'm like, I got something that came out. He's like, oh, well, you know, that was, that was my reformulation. I'm going to send you my original. So I went on that and about 17 days in the, like the day before my stomach starts rolling, I'm like, oh, my, just, I don't like stomach doesn't feel good. I was actually at a conference, but I wasn't speaking. So there's no reason to be like anxious or like the butterflies, you know, getting mm -hmm. ready to present type of thing. And the next day I'm going to the bathroom and immediately get this feeling of like, Whew, I feel so much better. And I look down, I go to wipe and I'm like, that didn't feel right. I looked, I looked down and there's these two worms hanging from me into the toilet bowl. They're dead, right. but they're hanging from me in the toilet bowl, uh, which were a scarus lumbricoides, so a type of roundworm, mm -hmm. uh, which is really one of the first kind that, that my body cleared out. And I was at the hotel. My wife and daughter happened to be there. My daughter was maybe about three at the time. And I yelled at my wife. I'm like, Heather, get over here. <laughs> and of course, of course, my daughter comes first. She comes running over and she looks at me and she looks down. She looks at me. She's like, dad, why do you have string hanging from your butt? And I'm like, Heather, <laughs> get over here, you know? And I get that just like 
she looks and she's like kind of turns away. But yeah. Like, what is that? You know, like the curiosity. I'm like, these are worms. My brother-in-law happened to be there, but he didn't, he didn't come over. You know? <laughs> uh, but, uh, so I grabbed some toilet paper and just slowly pulled it out. And then my mind just started racing. I'm like, wait a minute. If I, a relatively healthy guy have mm. these critters inside of me, who else does? Mm. And immediately I had just a, a ton of clients I was working with in the chronic Lyme disease world, which I feel like if you can get somebody well with chronic Lyme, like anything else, you know, you're good with. Like it, it's just a, it's a tough, tough scenario sometimes to be in. And uh, immediately put everybody on Mosapudica seed. And that was one of the biggest game changing protocol things that I've ever found was yeah, wow. really embarking on that. And the stuff that comes out of people, um, it's just, it's just unbelievable. So I had, I, and then the next month and a half I had like, probably, um, just pile, like every stool is like piles of worms. I'm like, where are these coming from? You know, they were like four to seven inches for like a month and a half. And then they stopped. I was like, Oh, I'm done. So I stopped. And then all of a sudden, like my stomach started feeling a little sensitive. My butt started itching. I'm like, ah, oh, maybe I got to go back on this. It went back on boom piles. And then it stopped. I'm like, Oh, I'm done. And then it happened again. And, and that's where I realized that one of the most important things that you can do in the parasite cleansing side of it is be persistent mm. and be consistent. Because the time that you think you're done, they just might not be hatching and there's still probably eggs in there. And so you want to, you know, when you think you're actually done cleansing, do at least another month. I like to I like to do at least 90 days off the bat for somebody initially. Some people need six months. Some people even need longer than a year just depend, depending on how bad the infection actually is within them. That's crazy. So had you traveled much as a kid to, to get these parasites or it just came from everyday living from the, th the things you were doing? I grew up in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in Florida for a short time. Lived in Milwaukee at the time when I was when I was doing the cleanse, um, and then I'd been I think to Cancun once and Puerto Vallarta once, and they were like to the resort. You know, yeah. it wasn't like out and about. But other than that, never had been. Well, actually, I take that back. I'd been to Olympics, uh, London, 2012, for like uh -huh. eight days, I think, before. But other than that, like London, Mexico, twice. Never left really the country. Yeah, and so and those places in particular, like Mexico, a little bit, but they're not necessarily countries that you would pick up a whole heap of different parasites from. Like maybe if you went to Asia, you could say yes, definitely, you might pick up some some parasites. Well, but well, that that's the myth, right? So we think that parasites know borders or mm. that they're not in first world countries, but the issue is is a lot of the testing's inadequate, and there's a lot of mechanisms that parasites can hide, which we can talk about if you want to go down that route. But the idea is if we don't have parasites in America, for instance, and I know you're in Australia, but if we don't have parasites in fill the blanket in our country, then the doctors aren't looking for them. If the doctors don't look for them, they don't find them. Therefore, they get to that conclusion that of what they thought, right, that, mm. that there isn't parasites. But what I found is that parasites is probably one of the biggest epidemics that's happening right now across the globe, and it's coming from – the toxicity epidemic. Mm -hmm. So we have over 80,000 different chemicals that have been created. Very few have ever been studied, let alone none of them have been in, uh, studied how they interact with one another, you know, having, like what's the likelihood of us having one chemical in our body? We're gonna have multiple and, and what happens. And so parasites are toxin sponges, especially for heavy metals. There's a big, you know, heavy metal epidemic. And so what I believe, why, why I believe there's a big, parasite infestation is first of all it's out of our culture it used to be in the culture the farmers would they'd cleanse the animals and the family members every spring and fall for parasites and it's like they, that doesn't happen anymore mm -hmm. um so we don't really go after parasites at all but then there's an epidemic because there's a toxicity epidemic that then's creating an environment where when we're exposed to parasites they thrive in our body and then they replicate and it, it it's like the blessing and curse because when a parasite comes in, they can absorb six times, sometimes eight times their weight in heavy metals. So they're taking the burden off of us. But then we get the toxin and the stressor from the parasite mm. uh, on that. And then the toxin is technically still in us. It's in the parasite, but it's, you know, it's still in our body. So when you kill – in, in order to – detox you have to kill the parasites off some of the some of the chemicals will leave with the debris some will actually be released in the body which is important to be on some kind of like binder like bioactive carbon that can bind on to the heavy metals that are getting released and then 
So as you clear parasites out, then that unlocks the ability to detox. That actually unlocks the ability to clear out chronic infection. That unlocks the ability to clear out mold. So it's like what I found clinically, and we can go more into this if you want, but I found that parasites are really that one of the biggest missing links in chronic infection. Mm. But it has to happen early because it unlocks the keys to the other vaults, if you will, to really uh, move forward. So somebody that's maybe treated – Lyme disease or they've treated mold and they uh, or they detox and they're like I just I feel like I hit a wall it's because you're missing something and usually that something is typically parasites ahead of, before you actually get to whatever that is you're trying to go after hmm, that's super interesting so would you like you said you're a, you're a healthy being you're um, functioning well yet you still had parasites so is it something that you actually recommend everyone goes through as a parasite cleanse Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because parasites are spread through the water yeah. supply, they're spread through the food supply, yeah, they're in they're in meat and they're on vegetables. It doesn't matter if you're plant-based or keto or paleo or anywhere in between like we're exposed to them. Uh, parasites are actually in the air. If somebody sneezes, they can sneeze out a pinworm egg. So hmm. uh, it's not just cover your mouth for a bacteria or a virus, but it's also like you spread you know, parasites. Mm. Um, it's found in the soil. There's hookworms. If you walk barefoot in the soil, which, you know, is the big thing, grounding and earthing and all that, um, you can actually get parasites, hookworms that attach and go right in there. Uh, if you have pets, you know, don't try it for those cat and dog lovers out there. I have, I have a little dog uh, and the dog definitely gets parasite cleanse as well too, mm -hmm. as my family members do. But um, don't, you know, have you seen where a dog will lick, you know, don't, don't kiss them. Yeah. Don't let them sleep in your bed. Cause you're basically like, if you're like, I can't get through these parasites, you're probably passing them back and forth between somebody in your family. So right. we want to, we want to really look at the environment and say, you know what? I can never remove myself where I, w there's always going to be an exposure. But the key is, is we just can't let the exposure of parasites get over done. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the issue we run into is where we never cleanse and they just get built up. What we want to do is we want to cleanse, bring them down, and then just periodically, you know, keep them down as they as they prop up because you can't live in a bubble. And so, for people who are, for instance, really looking after their food, look, looking after their nutrition, going on quite a whole space, like a whole diet, um, I guess is the best way to say it. But they're still having stool issues. Would you say that potentially that is coming from parasites then? Parasites are massive for leaky gut. Mm -hmm. They're massive for SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. They're yeah. massive for any GI issue. But but here's the thing to understand. Parasites are intestines, but they are uh, really overtaking the intestinal tract. And for those people that, oh, I've, I, you know, I did a water enema or I went for a colon, uh, I, you know, colon hydrotherapy or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. and I didn't see anything. Understand most of the parasites are actually in the liver, bile duct, and small intestine. And when you do just like a water enema or you get a, a colon hydrotherapy, you're just touching the large intestine, which is only three feet, and you're missing the other 20 feet of the small intestinal tube. So what I found, I like coffee enemas mm -hmm. uh, for really mobilizing the bile. Liver increases bile, increases glutathione, and it can really purge out those and move the critters because – Basically, pathogens like parasites, viruses, bacteria, retroviruses, all these types of critters, they like stagnation. Mm -hmm. They like stagnation, uh, less things moving. And so our, our friend is motion. I mean, we know this in exercise, right? Motion yeah. is life. Movement is life. Uh, when you, quote unquote, retire, uh, which is probably not a great word, means to like put out to pasture. But when, you know, when people retire, they a lot, a lot of times lose their mind because mm -hmm. they're not using it. They're not thinking yeah. about like it's a muscle, you know, you got to challenge it. Well, the same thing with our pathways in our body, that movement is life. We need to make sure the lymphatic system's moving, the liver bile duct, the colon, you know, all these systems are moving. And the more movement that they have, the less likely you are to really get drugged down with an infection because infection likes stagnation. So mm -hmm. not just movement for exercise, but movement really for your pathways too. So how about things like taking glutathione and maybe taking some apple cider vinegar, vinegar to try and increase your like your gut bile? Is that going to help at all? Um, so glutathione will stimulate phase two detoxification of liver. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stimulate the liver, the the bile production. Mm -hmm. uh, and then apple cider vinegar, as long as you don't have histamine issues, 
or like a histamine intolerance or yeah. kind of the, the new fad is mast cell, everybody's mast cell type of thing. But as long as you don't have that, apple cider vinegar is great at increasing stomach acid. So mm -hmm. if you break down, maybe what would be really valuable for your listener is if we break down the anatomy and look at GI. So when you mm -hmm. just think about, hey, I'm going to eat food, your stomach is going to start producing stomach acid. It's like, oh, food down the pipeline, let's get this rip rare and ready to go. You start chewing, yeah. you have enzymes in your mouth, you know, they break, you know, grains down into sugar and, you know, on you go. Well, as you swallow food, the food goes in the stomach, that acid there starts breaking the food down and it'll release it. It mm -hmm. releases it after a time portion and that goes into the small intestine. Now, stomach acid, very acidic, which can burn a hole right through your small intestine. So what mm -hmm. the body does is it releases bile to neutralize the stomach acid. Mm -hmm. So the liver, it's really the lifeline of the detox system. It's the, it, it plays a huge role with hormones, blood sugar with glycogen. There's all kinds of things with the liver and why it's just so important. If there's one organ to focus on, like the liver is up there, the brain's up there, you know, it's like hard to pick your favorite, but you got to put the liver up there. So the liver does detox phase one and phase two. Mm -hmm. Glutathione is involved in uh, phase two, just like acetylation, just like methylation, oxidation, yeah. you know, all these fancy terms people hear. And then there's something called phase three. Mm -hmm. Basically, phase one and two, uh, phase one converts chemicals, actually usually more into danger, in, into more dangerous chemicals to get it ready for phase two than phase two neutralizes it essentially. Mm -hmm. So you've got like detox in the liver. And then there's something called phase three detox, which is really drainage of okay, now that we've got this like byproduct of the chemical or the broken down part of the chemical or this chemical that we're releasing, like how do we get rid of it? And a lot of times it'll dump it into the bile. So the liver detoxes, the liver makes bile, and then that gets pushed into your bile ducts. If you still have a gallbladder, that's a storage sac mm -hmm. for the bile. So then when you eat, the sac squeezes so you get a big bile release. Well, the bile will have toxins in it. Pathogens love it, liver flukes, giardia, um, strongyloides, you know, all these uh, roundworms uh, will be in your bile duct. So you can get pathogens, you can get toxins, and these cause stagnation. These are sludge. This is like no mm -hmm. movement, right? So the bile has to get released to neutralize the stomach acid. Now the acid got released with the food from yeah. the stomach into the small intestine, and then it's there to it's there to emulsify fat too. But here's the thing: what we know in functional medicine is a lot of times people have GI issues. They have low stomach acid. Yeah. So should we take betaine HCL? Should we drink some apple cider vinegar? And usually the dose is one tablespoon for eight ounces, 20 to 30 minutes before a meal. Uh, work up to two tablespoons and eight ounces, right? So you're like stimulating the stomach acid, mm. which is all good if you can handle it um, because you're really you're, – you're getting stronger stomach acid, better GI. The question is that I keep coming back to is, well, why is there low stomach acid? And that's because of a bile issue. So what'll happen, let's say you have toxins and you have pathogens in the bile ducts, it's clogging it up. Yeah. You you take a big bite of some kind of food, it's got fat, protein, carbs, it gets, you know, it's in the stomach, it gets released, and now the body's like, wait a minute, um, you know, the bile gets released to neutralize the stomach acid, but there's not enough bile. So the so the body's like, wait a minute, we have too much acid. Mm -hmm. So the body then makes less stomach acid because of the less of the bile flow. Mm -hmm. So the solution isn't – I mean you can absolutely increase the stomach acid, but the solution is actually create better movement in that liver bile duct so that you actually have a better way to neutralize the stomach acid. Then the body will actually increase the stomach acid back up. With it. Okay. And then just to finish on the GI tract, so after you know the stomach acid neutralize, uh, is neutralized by the bile, then it goes to the small intestine, which is about 20 feet long, which is where a lot of the parasites are. Then that gets uh, basically goes through you know the junction of the large and small intestine, gets to the large intestine, which is three feet long. That's where a lot of the fluids gets pulled out, um, the stool gets drier, and then you know you poop and out out the body goes. So anything we look at from a parasite side, we want to look at the whole GI. There's actually parasites that love to be in the throat area that that cause a lot of swallowing issues. If you've ever, uh, if you heard anybody with like esophag esophagitis, eosinophilic esophagitis, that's like straight up parasite type issues uh, along with the liver bile duct, small intestine. So what I've found clinically is by taking anti-parasitic type herbs like mimosa pudica seed, uh, which is just an amazing like gel thing that'll kind of grab onto them and kill them and pull them out. 
um, by taking some Ayurvedic herbs like a clove, neem, vadanga, holarina, trifala, you know, like all these type of things that have been used for thousands of years over, you know, in, in places that have pretty bad infestations of parasites, we can start clearing them out and, and you know, start making a, a better environment. And that would be in liquid form of, of those different herbs? Uh, they can be in powder or liquid. Okay. Um, yep. So you'll find some in tinctures and liquids. You'll find some in capsules. Mm -hmm. uh, like Mimosa pudica seed, it's very gelatinous, so you want to get it in a capsule. Okay. Uh, you can open it up, you know, if if a, if you can't swallow or a child can't swallow. Uh, but you want to mix it with something that's like avocado oil or olive oil because you want to mix it with some fat because it's fat soluble. Mm -hmm. Or for like a child, you want to mix it with maple syrup because uh, it's it's not only the taste but it's the texture mm -hmm. that they have to get down. But it's oh my gosh, it's so it's just so amazing. Yeah, it sounds incredible. It's uh, it's kind of bizarre that it's not more widely known. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Dr. Todd Watts, who's um, is basically my partner with Microbe Formulas, business partner. Um, in in its funny story, like you never know the path that you're or where you're going to be. Like when you look forward, mm -hmm. uh, as we became friends, I actually tried to talk him out of having a supplement company because I'm like, you don't want to deal with the FDA and like. Luckily, he didn't listen to me. And then uh, my brother-in-law was like, hey, you guys should partner and really work on you know, parasite formulas and stuff. I'm like, that sounds like a good idea. And Todd's like, yep, that sounds good. I'm like, okay, so things are changing real quick. you know. But um, so he was really – Dr. Todd Watts uh, has been working with Mimosa pudica seed probably four and a half years clinically. Mm -hmm. He is the guy that's brought it uh, not only to the U.S. but really across the world. So if you haven't – you know, if somebody hasn't heard of Dr. Todd Watts or like myself – um, and, and maybe more recently now more people are talking about it as the word spreading, you know, but, um, you know, chances are you probably haven't heard of it yet. So there's mimosa pudica, uh, bark, there's the whole plant, but we've, what we found clinically is the seed. And yeah. then of course, you know, find a good source like organic. So, yeah, super interesting. Um, something I heard the other day was around SIBO and thyroid dysfunction and a lot of people who actually get diagnosed with a thyroid dysfunction actually the the big issue is related to their SIBO and once they clear up their SIBO so the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth uh, once they clear that up that they no longer have the thyroid dysfunction is that something that you've you've seen or looked into with your work there's a lot of correlation mm -hmm. so it can it can go both ways so SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth so if you think about the GI tract just for a little breakdown You've got the small intestine 20 feet long, mm. and then you've got the large intestine, which is like three feet long at the end. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth means that there's bacteria in the small intestine. And, and there is there is some bacteria in the small intestine, but the vast majority of your microbiome, your bacteria, you actually want in your large intestine, mm. and you specifically want first. So they're actually bacteria in the small intestine. So there's a couple factors with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and I'll circle back here to, to thyroid. Mm. So if you have a lack of bowel movements where you're just not pooping, and you might be saying like, how often do I have to poop? You know, once a day should be not should be enough. If if somebody has health issues or they're struggling with symptoms, you got to be going, uh, you got to be pooping at least two to three times a day. Uh, and not, not where you're getting watery stools, but anytime you're starting to you know, open up drainage pathways as you're starting to detox chemicals out, as you start killing pathogens off, you want to err on the side of making sure that the bowels are moving more often than less because if they're moving less, then those toxins get reabsorbed or they cause more inflammation, uh, you know, things just don't move. So um, a lack of bowel movement will actually cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's one of the causes. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if, if there's not enough peristalsis in the intestinal tract, it can cause that. Um, if you're working with a practitioner, like a osteopath, chiropractor, massage therapist, PT, you can have them check something called the ileocecal valve. It's the junction between the small intestine, and large intestine. If that's propped open, then you're going to get a backflow of bacteria, get small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Um, the kidney, or I should say the liver bile duct that we talked about, or I talked about earlier, that's intricate to make sure that the bowels are moving. Mm -hmm. uh, so not just the bowels, but also focus on the liver bile duct. And then what I've seen clinically is parasites are a massive cause of SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. So now, so now let's circle back to the thyroid. The thyroid yeah. So the so the thyroid, when it's hypo hypo functioning, right, like hypo, like less than yeah. uh, optimal function, it'll actually slow the bowels down. 
So a lower functioning thyroid could stimulate SIBO because of the slow bowel movement, right? Mm. But having having SIBO itself, I don't think that's a huge factor in the thyroid. But if you look at, well, what's causing SIBO? Is it parasites? Well, parasites are one of those causes of Hashimoto's or autoimmune type thyroid issues. Uh, we're looking at Lyme disease. We're looking at viruses like Epstein Barr. We're looking at toxins like mercury has a really high affinity for the thyroid. So, anytime there's thyroid, um, you know, a, a low functioning thyroid could trigger bowel issues, which then could trigger other things like SIBO. But then having parasites that causes SIBO could also trigger, you know, the the thyroid dysfunction. Uh, inevitably, it comes down to either there's a chronic toxicity issue or a chronic infection primarily and then those things oftentimes create chronic deficiencies and it could just be a poor diet too and and the Mm. soil quality but ultimately it's really those that end up being the foundation and then you know you got to factor in lifestyle you got to factor the food that you're taking in you got to factor your stress level emotions you know those kind of things but chronic toxicity chronic infection is probably the two biggest things i see in the functional medicine world yeah, wow. And so when you get someone who comes to you who has, for instance, gone through a similar route to your wife, they've gone and they've done all the different things, they're really looking after the nutrition, um, maybe they're a little stressed, uh, but uh, outside of that, like everything seems to be going all right. Is that kind of the first place you look? Um, it's the order. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first book I wrote that you mentioned earlier, Five Steps to Restoring Health Protocol, you know, that was like a mind dump. I just had just years of research and stuff put together. And I was like, I just need to condense it, you know, and Mm. kind of put it into a system that makes more sense. And that's where that was kind of birthed from. And then from there, it's really evolved and kind of grown. So I'm not, I think I can share my screen on Skype. Can I? Yeah. Uh, The little double button at the bottom. It's like a. Oh, there we go. Oh yeah. The double screen. Okay. Uh, Let me see. So for those on audio, you can jump across to the YouTube channel and you'll find the video. There we go. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is kind of a crazy chart. And uh, if anybody wants to email me, I can just email it to them or I can send it to you and you can post this PDF or whatever below the... So um, what, what I figured out is if somebody is still struggling or they're just not where they need to be, they've done a lot of stuff, it's like either... They haven't done a proper protocol like in what they, you know, oh, I did parasites, but I didn't, that didn't really help me. It's like, okay, well, that that could absolutely be it. But also, too, we want to look at the fact of the order. And I believe the order is probably the most important thing. So as you're looking at this image, and for those that can't see it, I'll just verbally explain it. From left to right, the first thing is detect. And what detect means is understand, okay, what are the things that are actually causing you health issues? And the top four things that I see clinically And this is not including food. This is not including uh, emotional trauma. But the top four things would be parasite infection that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, It would be mold issues, an environment that then triggers mold within the body. Uh, It'd be toxicity and primarily pesticides and heavy metals. And then the fourth thing is other chronic infection outside of parasites, which is really more like Lyme disease, Epstein-Barr virus, and these retroviruses um, that we're finding. So – understand what what is wrong with you first or like what are the things that you got to work on then uh, we need to go through in the right order and if you're not sure just assume everything's an issue and then you know you can kind of knock the dominoes down from there so the Mm -hmm. second thing that we want to focus on if you just follow the black arrows uh kind of disregard the red arrows because that's just that kind of gets really deep (laughs) but uh if you look at the black arrows Um, the next stage is drainage. And what that means is that's opening up your pathways. So that's making sure that you're pooping. Uh, that's making sure the liver bile duct is moving the kidneys, the lymphatic system, the skin and sweat, all these things. Because if we jump into killing something, or if we jump into detoxing a chemical and trying to pull it out of the body and the pathways aren't moving, it's got nowhere to go. You're going to cause symptoms. You're going to crash. You're not going to feel good. So we want to focus with drainage and opening up those pathways. Then the next thing is parasites. And this is kind of like the mother cell. <clears throat> this is uh, this is really the mother cell in, in the area that we have to focus with so heavily first because mold spores. So let's say you're in a mold environment and then um, – 
I don't even know how to sh- stop sharing my screen here for a second. I need to get mm-hmm. back on Skype and then yeah, perfect. Oh, there you go. Okay, so um, so parasites have to be dealt with first because let's say you're in a moldy environment. You're mm-hmm. you work in mold, you live in mold, or your school's in mold, and you're exposed, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know remedy remedy the mold. I'm gonna clear this clear you know make sure the environment's safe, but yet you're still struggling with mold symptoms. Mold spores can live inside of parasites. And they can keep replicating. So even huh. if you move into an environment that's safe mold-wise, you can still be mold sick mm. uh, because of parasites are housing the mold spores. So that's where parasites have to be before you can really clear yourself of mold. Um, parasites are sponges for heavy metals, like I mentioned. So yeah. in order to truly detox, we got to re- you know we got to kill the parasites to make sure that all the metals we can actually grab onto. And then the other thing is. Researchers like Dr. Alan McDonald has found that Lyme disease lives safely within certain types of parasites like nematodes or roundworms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so somebody that's maybe been down the, you know, whether it's natural or pharmaceutical and they're like, kill, 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 kill. And then as soon as I stop, I crash. Why can't I get over Lyme? It's because you've got these things that are shielding Lyme disease. And this goes for other critters, Bartonella, uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, like all these things, right? So heavy metals will protect through the biofilm. Parasites, though, will be a house for these critters. So if you're mm. just trying to kill these critters, but you don't clear the parasite out, it's an uphill battle. And so as we look, as we look at really looking at this order, what is the most important thing is the order. So we have to support drainage we got to clear parasites and then that unlocks us to really detox heavy metals Mm. then that unlocks us to actually deal with chronic illness and what i figured out in all this is as you march through the system this system is not only effective for somebody that's dealing with chronic lyme disease which like if you ask ask the doctor hey stage four cancer or stage three cancer or chronic lyme disease and you know like been dealing with it for 10 years, most of them will probably say, you know, the cancer side, because it's more straightforward. And, you know, there's like, it, it all kind of falls in line and makes sense. Chronic Lyme disease, a lot of times is very like, whoo, I don't know about that. Mm. But what I figured out is that this is very effective for Lyme. But if you can get somebody with chronic Lyme disease, well, everybody else fits into this in some way, just because maybe Lyme isn't the major factor for you, doesn't mean that it, you don't have chronic infection in your body, you know, so um, I feel like there's just a lot of value, and if we understand the order, we can save so much time. Because I detoxed for two years with chelation, every four hours, and this is before you know other things are available now that are safer and make it easier. But I detox for two years, wake, waking up in the middle of the night to take these chelators, you know, and it 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 helped. But I was like, mm, this isn't you know like this isn't like boom, I'm you know. Mm-hmm super optimal and what I didn't hit the parasites and as soon as I hit the parasites it was like boom that was the key that unlocked the doors that now I'm like wow my brain is sharp I'm thinking clear my skin is less sensitive my guts less sensitive I'm like you know I don't get sick all the time when I travel or over the winter time you know like I'm good rip rare ready to go and then I look back at my symptoms, grinding teeth and food allergies and, you know, all these different things. And I'm like, oh, it was parasites. Hmm. But I can't go back. But it gives me perspective of like, wow, how important it is. And so that's what I want to, you know, obviously convey to your listener right now is don't skip over parasites because it can be a massive piece. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and so for you now, like you said, you used to have uh, – food intolerances. Have you gotten rid of those through getting rid of the parasites? Yeah, yeah. I really don't have. Um, I developed a severe, when I was detoxing metals, um, it really flared up, but I developed a severe allergy to cashews, mm-hmm. uh, sunflower seeds, um, almonds. Um, and I can, I, I, I tend not to eat them because of my past, like, mm. you don't, know, reactions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but almond flour and stuff, you know, because there's a lot of like grain free options that are almond flour and things like, you know, I do fine. Yeah. Um, So that's super cool. There you go. Um, So you did talk in your book uh, about things that people can do at home, little tests they can do to maybe see whether they have 
either chronic fatigue or sorry, adrenal fatigue or some sort of thyroid dysfunction going on. Um, could you talk about those those basic things and it's like signs and symptoms that your body might be giving in regards to, hey, this this might be the thing that you're having or that you're dealing with? Yeah, so um, thinking about the thyroid versus the adrenals, uh, there's a lot of like overlapping symptoms. Mm. The technical word for the adrenals, because if you say adrenal fatigue, some people would be like, well, that's really not a diagnosis. You know, it's just making it up. Well, there's when you actually look in the literature, it's adrenal insufficiency. It's it's the these little glands that sit on your kidneys that just can't keep up with the stress. And mm. the stress can be emotional. The mm. stress can be physical where you're working out too much and you're not recovering enough or you can't recover fast enough and you know you overtax your body the stress could also be chemical or mm -hmm. you know a chronic infection you know chronic toxicity right where it stresses your body out and you just like oh it just so adrenals adrenals have to be in the middle right they mm -hmm. they they can't be under functioning they can't be over where they're stage 1 type adrenal fatigue so there's tests that you can do uh, to test for those things i always recommend because it's so easy to spend thousands of dollars mm -hmm. on labs. I always recommend assume everything is an issue and then go after the main sources. Like I said, mold, parasites, toxins, and the smaller chronic infection. And if you do it in the right order, oftentimes you can put the finances that you would have ran, ran for you know a few tests to then be like, well, is that really an accurate test? Is it super conclusive? Mm -hmm. Even if it showed up, no, does that really mean I don't have parasites? Like, no, you still... <laughs> still need to do it, you know, like the tests just stink that are out there. So I would rather assume like, hey, everything's an issue and then realize that thyroid problems are always second, they're always a symptom of something underlying. Mm -hmm. So as you get farther along your journey and you're like, gosh, I still think my thyroid's messed up, then you can run testing, right? And then you can get more focused with the thyroid. But I really think we want to think big picture right away. So um, looking at you know, some different symptoms like heart palpitations can be hyperthyroid, um, you know, missing part of the, the outside third of your eyebrows can be hypo, like a low. low. So hyper means too much, hypo means too low. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your body always wants to be like homeostasis in the middle. Uh, slow GI, bad skin issues, um, you know, hair problems, nails, you know, those can all be linked with thyroid metabolism, you know, is a big factor. So if you're like, gosh, I'm eating bird seed and I work out for three hours a day and I'm still like overweight, like what's going on? You know, it can be a metabolism, but a lot of times it's a hormonal issue where your mm -hmm. body, you know, through inflammation can't hear the hormones. Adrenals, a lot of times adrenals, um, you won't sleep good, which is a big factor because if you yeah. don't sleep, you can't heal. And then if you don't sleep good, then you don't have great energy during the day and it's like this cycle you get caught in. The adrenals, I think um, there's some great things out there that you can support and test it out. Licorice short extract is good. If you have high blood pressure, uh, then you don't want to take that. But usually people that have adrenal issues actually have low blood pressure. So that's a symptom where mm -hmm. you're sitting and you go to stand up or you're laying and you go to stand up and you feel a little like woozy or lightheaded or dizzy. Uh, that's a sign of uh, adrenal issues because the adrenal should actually help pump that blood pressure up a little bit to deal with the pressure or the position change. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it gets classified as POTS and uh, orthostatic orthostatic tachycardia, you know, type of thing, postural orthostatic ta ta tachycardia. Sorry, uh, so that can get you know get thrown in their language there. But um, most people, I feel like, have stressed adrenals to some degree. Mm -hmm. It's at what stage? So licorice root extract, uh, if somebody is plant-based, this probably isn't a great option, but there's like desiccated adrenals from some different companies. Uh, there's adaptogenic herbs like rhodiola, ashwagandha, things like that. Mm -hmm. But what I found is if you take that, yes, that can help pep you up. It can help give some life to the adrenals. But if you don't get to the underlying source, or cause or cause is, you're stuck on those supplements forever and you're like, mm -hmm. every time I stop on my crash, it's like, because we're missing a source. So I'd rather have the, the listener focus on, I'm gonna get to the source rather than try to manage symptoms. And and there's nothing wrong with doing both, right? So yeah. I look at it as let's go to the upstream to the sources and then how do we minimize your symptoms as much as possible so that life's more normal as you're working upstream? Because as long as you work upstream, you're going to get well and stay well, and as long as we can minimize symptoms, then life will be more tolerable, and you're not going to be, you know, mad at your sniffing other, or you know, like 
be yelling at your kids or boss or you know blah 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 so mm. i think people just get to that that point of despair because it's like well i've tried everything now what what could it potentially be whereas it's like you're saying like maybe they haven't actually looked deep inside to, to find the actual cause um who would you recommend working with i know you guys have the online coaching that you do provide so how do you um or who do you recommend working with in regards to actually finding the cause and figuring out what's going on well, yeah. So just to backtrack one, one step there where you said, you know, people are like, I, Hey, I tried everything. It's like, no, that's actually a mind issue right there. Because mm. if you had tried everything, you'd have what you'd have the result of what you're looking for, which you don't have the result, which means you haven't. So we, 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 we create these things or we create these stories in our head that mm-hmm. then become excuses that then are self-fulfilling. But it's like, no, let's really get real. Like you've probably tried a lot of stuff, but clearly Either you're missing a piece or pieces Mm -hmm. or you've done it in the wrong order. Maybe you've done everything right, but you've done the wrong order. And if we just change or tweak a few things like, boom, you're going to, you know, be so much better. So, um, but as far as like what to do, honestly, get educated, just learn, you know, listen, it's like podcasts like this. It's like, these are just wealth wealth of knowledge of like, Oh, I hadn't thought about this. And then we can start putting people pieces together. Like we're at a stage right now in humanity. I feel like we're, we're starting to raise our level of consciousness and we're starting to wake up and we're starting to see things that we haven't. And we're starting to question like, wait a minute, why would I go to a regular doctor? Why would I take this pharmaceutical? Why, why would I listen to a doctor that's never had nutrition advice to give me nutrition advice? You know, Mm -hmm. like we, we start actually thinking beyond and we're like, wait a minute, I'm going to, I'm going to, take the reins here. Like I'm going to figure this out, you know? And so people that resonate, you know, that you resonate with follow, you know, YouTube is a great source, uh, Mm -hmm. iTunes, you know, there's tons of summits that are out there and documentary series. And it's like, you don't have to be obsessed where every single moment of the day you're listening and watching it because you you do still need to live your life. But there's seasons and periods in your life where it's like, you know what, I really got to get my health on track Mm -hmm. and I need to dedicate extra time in this category. And then as you, you know, listen to maybe your favorite podcast person like yourself and it's like, oh, they have, you know, this doctor, that, that, that sounds really cool. Then go down that route of listening to more stuff from that practitioner mm-hmm. and, and, and then see where that gets you. And it's like, we just want to keep expanding our knowledge. Um, as far as the, like the basic side, and of course I'm, I'm biased on this, but I always recommend people to start with our protocol that we developed at microbe formulas. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you can, you know, put a link to that. But um, I would recommend, you know, that, that that's really effective for a mass amount of people. And then, uh, you know, as you go through that and you're like, you know what, I feel like there's maybe some things lingering, then that's where you want to go to the next level, right? Where, like, I mean, I've got an at-home program where people can do it themselves. I think, though, I really believe nothing replaces one-on-one customization. But that's also like the most time consuming for the practitioner. It's the it's the biggest investment as far as monetary. It's not an expense, mm-hmm. right? We're investing in our health. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe not everybody's able to do that or ready for that. So it's like wherever you're at in your journey, just keep moving forward and keep putting the pieces together. And the moment you know, get, get around your stinking thinking. It's like, no, you haven't, you're, you're missing something. And what is that? And keep moving forward. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's, we never grow on the top of the mountain. We grow in the Valley, but we're also like most angry and frustrated usually in the Valley. But then when we get to the mountain, we're like, Oh, thank you for that Valley. Because now I'm like at a way higher mountain than I've ever been at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that analogy. That's great. Um, going back to mold really quickly. And in regards to toxicity, like a lot of people would think, okay, I've got mold. I'll get rid of it with some bleach. Um, and cause more toxicity within the within the house or within the the workplace. What do you recommend for cleaning? Um, say, for instance, a moldy a moldy house. Yeah, so never use bleach. Um, and it's not just for the the chemicals of bleach. Bleach is actually water based. So let's say you have mold on your wall, right? Your sheetrock wall or a piece of wood, and you wipe. You take some bleach on a rag or you put it on it and you wipe it off and you're like, wow, that looks clean. Well, there's still roots and mold that are actually growing deep within the wall or deep within the wood. And now you cleared the surface mold. So you gave it like, oh, it looks clean now, but it's actually not. There's actually mold deep. And the water base of the of the bleach will actually feed the mold that's deep within there. So it'll typically create a worse problem. So Mm -hmm. bleach could be used. 
um, possibly just for something that's like not absorbent, right? Like, uh, I don't know, a hard plastic or something, right? Like on Tupperware or like a storage containers, but, I, but I'm never a fan just cause of the toxicity side yeah. of it. Um, but as far as mold, you always want to fi- figure out why is there mold? There's always some kind of water intrusion. Uh, you want to figure out what's the source, like why is there mold first? And then you want to remedy the situation. It can get a little complex because mm-hmm. you don't want to sp- – like anytime you open a wall up and you're like, I think there's mold behind it. As soon as you open that wall up, it can make the situation so much worse because now spores are going to float around that hadn't had the ability. So you want to be very careful about when you investigate. Uh, I do like to recruit in experts in the mold locally mm-hmm. to you know inspect and also to get an opinion on how to remedy because just taking it on yourself, you know, if you open a wall up where the mold's contained behind the wall and all of a sudden you have your AC or your heat on, uh, and those spores get sucked up in the HVAC and they spread throughout the house. Now you just had a contained mold that now is spread throughout the house, which can contaminate couches and mattresses and clothing. And next thing you know, it's just a disaster to try to really remedy because it's, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess one thing I do want to tie back to is Lyme's disease and in particular, like you, you're running the, oh, sorry, the host of the chronic Lyme's disease summit. Um, and you've now run three variations of this. What, what are you guys doing at this summit and what are you, what's the, the big thing that you're trying to get out? Yeah. So I, I was at, um, a conference and it was one of those moments like, it's actually probably one of these only moments I've had in my life like this where I, I, I was speaking. So that, you know, they give you, you give you a room. I was just in my room by myself sleeping and all of a sudden 4 AM, like I sat up and I'm like chronic Lyme disease summit. Like all, I'm like, where did that come from? And, and, uh, so immediately like all of a sudden that idea, you know, appeared or, you know, from spirit or wherever, right. God or whatever. And, and then I decided, I'm like, I could get the message out of Lyme disease. And so I interviewed, you know, 30 plus experts, had a summit. And I was like, oh, that was that was awesome. And then I had all these people reach out. I was like, that was such great information. We need more. We want more. And it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll do a second one. And then I got the same thing after the second one. So I'm like, we'll do a third one. And I haven't decided, you know, what what the future holds. Like it's, you know, there's so much going on. I haven't, but I've, I've done three Lyme disease summits, did a detox one, the detox project, and then uh, a parasite summit because I realized, you know, it's had that like eye opener of, wow, parasites are so important. So I don't, I'm not sure what the future lies. I'm on a lot of, you know, podcasts and summits. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I don't know if I really want to go through all the work of hosting because as appreciate things that you do and, and others, uh, in this space, it's, it's a lot of work actually to put on, you know, yeah. um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of heart and blood, blood sweat, uh, <laughs> with it. So I guess we'll see, you know, I wrote, wrote a couple of books, um, in a bunch of docuseries and things like that. So just kind of like to go with the flow and, and as things come out, you know, just participate. And, you know, if I have one of those moments where I wake up, I'm like, okay, I got to do number four, then, then so be it. So we'll go ahead. Um, and so with Lyme's disease, uh, I believe it can, like in Australia in particular, it comes from ticks. Um, is, is there, like, what is the main cause for, for Lyme's disease kind of worldwide? And is it actually fully curable? Yeah. So in my, um, I believe that disease can't exist inside of a healthy body. Mm-hmm no matter what that name is, you know, no matter what the bacteria, no matter what the diagnosis is, disease can exist where there is health within the body. So if we focus on how do we build health rather than just battle disease or battle Mm -hmm. some bug, I feel like we're always going to be better off. So as there hope, absolutely. Is my wife have an issue anymore with Lyme? No, like we, we actually ran, we ran tests before tests that aren't even available now. And where she was off the charts acute to not only negative, but a zero, like we know, you know, her body, her body's really, um, done so well with it. So I believe that anybody can heal and I believe that there's possibility. Now, is there limitation? Possibly depending on what's going on, surgeries, traumas, right? But I believe that everybody can improve their health. Um, what was the other party question? Uh, like, I guess what exactly is Lyme's disease and, and yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And how, how it's spread. So the, the classic thing is Lyme is spread through a tick bite. Mm -hmm. Um, but in my newest book, how to fix Lyme disease, I went through a bunch of research and showed like it's carried in other mammals and rodents and mosquitoes and flies and like all these things can actually like carry and transmit 
Lyme disease. So, um, and it's, it's a spirochete. There's only like three other, there's only three spirochetes really total that we know of. One of them is syphilis, which is a sexually transmitted disease, which surfaces on the skin, which is why like, oh, you, you've got it because we can see it. Lyme isn't skin. So mm. it's, it, I mean, sometimes people develop the rash, but very rarely. So it's, it oftentimes go undetected. And it seems like, you know, if mom can spread Lyme in the womb, so a, a pregnant mom can pass it on to a womb, and it's a big mm-hmm. cause of miscarriages. Um, and it's a spirochete category, and Lyme can be passed down through the milk. There was research done in cows that uh, the cow's milk was found to have Lyme disease. So it's wow. like maybe we're maybe we're jumping right from human to cow, but like could mom in breast milk have it? Yeah, I mean, it's very plausible, but uh, even sexually transmitted. So your partner, you know, that can be a factor. So th- there's a lot of ways I believe that you can be affected by it. But instead of just kind of living in the fear of Lyme disease itself, if you focus on building health in your body, even if you're exposed to it, your body's going to be able to overcome it and not going to get you down and out. But when you're in a weakened state, when you're inflamed, when you're ridden with other infection and inflammation and toxins, then you're just asking for more issues and it's going to be a you know big uphill battle. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, well, I am conscious of your time and I think we've about hit the hour. So what we might do, Dr. J, is uh, wrap it here. But I mean, I feel like we've only just touched the surface. So where is the best places for people to kind of get in touch? Where can they get your books from? Um, I, I'm about midway through the, the five steps to restoring health protocol and I think it's awesome. I think you've done a great job. So uh, where can people kind of reach out if they did want to follow on in the micro formulas and everything? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, my, my main website is drjdavidson.com. Doctors, D-R, J is J-A-Y, and then Davidson. Like Harley Davidson, just <laughs> no relationship to the motorcycle company. <laughs> I'd say unfortunately, but you know what? We all have a path. Uh, so doctor, <laughs> drjdavidson.com. Uh, the microbe formulas, it's microbeformulas.com. Uh, otherwise, pretty much all the links are on my drjdavidson.com. Uh, books are on Amazon. You know, uh, there's a podcast, you know, Facebook page, YouTube, all that, but it's pretty much all linked on the main, my main website. Yeah, I didn't see that. And so the mimosa pudica seed, uh, you can get that from micro formulas if people were yeah. interested in yep. doing that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. We have an organic mimosa pudica seed yep, yeah. that we have. Unreal. Well, I, I think that's a good place to start for everyone. <laughs> Yep, it's a great. Uh, you'll be it, you'll be amazed at what can come out of you, you know. So not everybody has to pull things out. Just forewarning, but if you do, uh, hopefully my story helped in just kind of calming your nerves of what to do. So make sure you show everyone first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you'd be amazed at the pictures or texts I get. One oh. one time, uh, a client texts me. And it beeped and we're just ready to sit down for dinner. And I was like, oh, this is one reason I should never check my phone around mealtime, you know. So, but oh, I, I just ask people what I'm working on. I'm like, just, just email me, you know, if you want to. But try, try not to text me because, you know, but yeah, it happens. Don't necessarily want to see that. Well, no, that's awesome. And I think uh, I think the, the world around metal toxicity and what we are actually having to deal with as a population is growing. Uh, people are starting to understand more that – the things we see daily, the the things that uh, that we have to take in, so through food, through oxygen, through everything, it's definitely becoming a bit more prevalent to, yes, we need to take a look into this. Um, I mean, the parasites that you've brought to light today is just another side of it. So thank you very much for that and thank you for your time. We really appreciate it, Dr. J. Thank you. Awesome.